Uh, so I'm Stephen Hillian, and I'm co-founder and uh, uh, product lead at Alpine Data Labs. And DB Sai is a senior research engineer focusing data science and machine learning uh, at Netflix, and also a Spark contributor. Um, and uh, DB's the star of the show. He did all the work on the functions that we're about to talk about. Uh, I'm sort of a consumer of those, and so I thought maybe the role that I can play is help to introduce sort of the motivation for some of the work that we did around these uh, linear models. Uh, so I'll give a brief introduction uh, to what we did and sort of the motivation. I'll talk about a little bit of the background around linear, nonlinear, nonparametric models, uh, how feature engineering can help with uh, making linear models more powerful, talk a little bit about regularization, and I'll hand over to DB, who will explain the implementation of the elastic net uh, linear and logistic regression models that he built uh, that's now at part of Sparks, part of MLlib. Uh, in 1.4, uh, and he'll talk through how that was implemented uh, and some of the benchmarks around that and how it compares to sort of state-of-the-art classification algorithms. Um, so I don't think anybody would disagree that classification is a very important problem. Uh, it's a very common problem in uh, government, business, research. Um, uh, some classic examples of this are things like um, uh, churn analysis, um, uh, survival analysis, uh, fraud detection. Um, even problems uh, that have been attacked with other methods, like collaborative filtering for product recommendation, can themselves be recast into the world of classification models. Um, and we see that, in some sense, for the average data scientist, something like logistic regression is sort of such a core and important part of the toolbox um, that I think while trends can come and go around some of the other classification algorithms, uh, logistic regression especially is still a powerful method, and some of the, the research that has been done around this and some of the new implementations in Spark are particularly useful for people like me who work on large-scale data sets. Um, some of the classification problems I deal with, so for example, we're working on right now, one right now for a, uh, for a large manufacturer uh, that is focused on identifying and predicting machine failure, and what they will do is they create widgets that go, say, on the back of the car. One of the ones that we're looking at at the moment is, is something that goes on the back of the car to do the beep, beep, beep noise as you back up. Uh, you don't want those to fail in the field, otherwise you get a small child being knocked over. So what they do is they look at the tests and the uh, production quality data that comes for those widgets uh, in their data sets, many hundreds of tests and different um, uh, probes that are inserted alongside the manufacturing pipeline. And for those widgets that don't fail those tests but then fail later out in the field, they want to see if they could have predicted that within the factory. Um, you've got then millions of widgets being produced every month. Uh, you've got tens of thousands of variables being tested uh, as inputs into the potential failure. And so you've got these very, you've got big data in both senses, both wide and long. Uh, and often the relationships between uh, uh, the variables can be highly complex and, and in many cases, nonlinear. Um, so these days, kind of flavor of the month are, are algorithms like neural nets and uh, random forest and SVMs, and those are very powerful, can get very high accuracy. But for me, as sort of a practitioner of data science, what I need uh, above all, um, maybe even more than accuracy, are models that I can get into production quickly, that can be scored quickly, um, and uh, that are interpretable. In many cases, the models that I want to build aren't actually going to go into production. I want to be able to glean business meaning from them. Uh, so I want models that are easy to interpret and that are fast to run, and that's often not the case for the non-parametric models, which, heuristically at least, can explode with the size of the data. Uh, so the solution that um, DB and the team have been working on uh, tries to solve these problems with a couple of things. We use linear models, which are nice and simple and well-known, we do automated feature generation, in particular with polynomial mappings that can expand the feature set, but still keep it under control. Uh, and then use regularized regressions as a means of limiting the size of the data uh, of the models eventually and making for more parsimonious and inter interpretable models. Um, and also having some optimization techniques to say that even if your feature set does explode a little bit, we control for memory and so on so that it can run quickly uh, in a framework like Spark. Uh, we actually use this as part of our product, so we regularly run very large regressions, as I was saying, um, uh, certainly into the hundreds of millions and billions of rows and tens of thousands of variables. Uh, and we've able to be, uh, the, the implementation that DB has worked on is so simple that we can wrap it up in a simple UI, UI with a bunch of different parameters. It gets extremely high uh, accuracy. We've used this most recently for a large telco consultant group that sells churn models to 
you know, the big telco vendors, um, and very highly accurate churn models. We've used it there. And internal testing, we can definitely see that on sort of bulked up versions of data sets like MNIST, where you bulk it up to work on, say, you know, hundreds of millions of rows, it runs in just a matter of minutes uh, and, and is, is very rapid indeed and conducive for, to, for sort of iterative modeling. Um, so let's do a little bit of background and then I'll hand over to DB. So first of all, linear nonlinear. Um, many of you, of course, will be familiar with this already. So when you're trying to do classification uh, in the sort of classic, say, logistic regression sense uh, on simple SVM, you will have a, 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 a line that you're drawing or a hyperplane that you're drawing between points trying to find an optimal boundary separating red and green, true and false. Uh, but in many cases, the boundary in the solution space is, um, or rather in the feature space, is, is nonlinear um, uh, and can be highly irregular, in fact. Uh, so the solution to this can be to use, uh, say, non-parametric models that are good at gleaning the form of the model out from the data set itself, um, but as I say, can be slow and difficult to interpret, either slow to train or slow to execute, uh, perhaps more importantly. Uh, or we can go with the approach that we've gone, which is to use uh, linear models, uh, but uh, bulk them up a little bit with uh, feature generation. Feature generation, of course, is the real art of the data scientist, and I think that's sort of part of the philosophy behind this approach. Feature generation can be done manually when you know that log of income is probably more likely to be linear related to volume than, uh, than just income alone, or it can be done in an and or it can be done in an automated way where you can apply different transformations and allow the coefficients of those transformations to be borne out by the training of the model. Um, quickly, some examples of linear models, of course, logistic regression, uh, SVM, um, Naive Bayes, uh, LDA, uh, and some nonlinear examples. Almost all of these, maybe with the exception of neural networks and non-parametric models, and all of these are, well, many of these are quite powerful, uh, but again can yield models that are of the size that is sort of roughly proportional to uh, the feature space, uh, and therefore pretty unwieldy. Um, the second ingredient in this talk is going to be around feature engineering. Uh, and to give a very simple case, uh, referring to these sort of nonlinear boundaries here, if you wanted to separate the, the red and the blues, uh, that's not clear how to do that in this original uh, two-dimensional space. Uh, you can't draw a simple line between these. But if you notice that the blues always have the same sign uh, for their, co for their um, coordinates and the reds have opposite signs, if you were to multiply one of, uh, two of the coordinates together to produce a, a second replacement substitute coordinate, uh, you would get those being nicely separated by a line. Um, so essentially your boundary then is sort of x1 times x2 equals a constant. So kind of like a, a rectangular hyperbola in the original space, and you can see how that would have worked uh, in that space to give you a, a hyperbola that would have separated those. If you go back to that circle example, just x squared plus y squared uh, equals a constant, can lift up the space so that now you can separate, uh, say, a circle of blue and red points uh, with a simple hyperplane in that higher dimensional space that maps down to a circle in the feature space. But again, just with a simple second order polynomial transformation, you're able to get this separation. Um, so we've deliberately chosen sort of second order because what we found with a lot of the testing that we did uh, was that second order, and also some of the research that's out there that DB will touch on in a second, is that second order polynomial expansions can work pretty well in terms of providing accurate models. Um, now, you may say, well, I don't know ahead of time by looking at my data, because I can't look at high dimensional data, what that, what that separation boundary should be, so how do I know what transformation to apply? But of course, if what you do is you throw in all the ingredients, all the possible second order uh, summands in, into, um, uh, into, uh, uh, into your model, uh, then the model can, during the training phase can actually find that out for itself. Um, and the order of the size of the model then is going to be about order n squared, and if you think about kernel methods, the, the size of the model is getting to be sort of like n times the number of uh, observations, which of course can be absolutely enormous. Um, so the, the complexity, the dimensionality of the, of, the, of, the, um, uh, of the problem in this case can be really relatively quite small, sort of order n squared in the number of features n, or even smaller than that because when the number of features is very large, typically that corresponds to problems where the input, the training set is is very sparse. Uh, and so it's really a sort of different order of magnitude in terms of the number of, uh, uh, the number of features that are going into, in, into the training of the model. Um, so that, that can be a little bit of the strength about using these simple polynomial mappings as opposed to full uh, kernel methods um, that you might use in something like SVM. 
Um, and there's a nice theorem. This, I, you know, I, I'm not really the scientist here, and so I, this doesn't really, this seems either trivially obvious or highly complicated. Uh, this essentially says that if you map things into higher dimensional spaces, uh, then you're more likely to be able to find that hyperplane and find a linear and separable way uh, than in the low dimensional space. Well, that seems kind of clear to me, so I think I must be missing something. But anyway, it's good to know that the thing works in some theoretical sense. Um, uh, the next ingredient is to talk about regularization. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of slides to go through here, so I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this, but I think I just want to emphasize from, um, from a sort of data scientist point of view what the purpose of regularization is. Um, so as we do expand the feature space by creating all these extra features by using polynomial mappings and so on, um, it's still under control, it's still n squared, it's something that's finite, but still it can, it can explode pretty widely and you don't want to end up with that many coefficients that's difficult to score. Uh, it's difficult to train, it's difficult to interpret. Uh, so what we also want to do is to sort of penalize uh, the model during the training phase for incorporating too many features into the final model form. Um, so there are, um, a standard sort of way of doing this is to apply what's called lasso uh, regularization, where you essentially take the absolute value of the coefficients and make that um, a penalization in your cost function when you're training the model. Uh, and that works pretty well, and because of the way the geometry works out, it essentially pushes as many of the coefficients down to zero as it possibly can. So if you have variables that uh, you, you don't really need in the model, that don't have a lot of weight in contributing to the model, they'll essentially get pushed down to zero, and so you have a, a very parsimonious model. You have just a relatively small number of variables that are going into the model. That's great. Uh, the problem with that uh, is that sometimes you get rid of variables that you actually don't want to get rid of. So if you have a model that has a lot of sort of grouped variables, like, uh, like zip code, say, uh, and, and you don't actually want to throw those out, they might be pretty collinear with one another, but you don't want to throw them out for the, for the, for the purposes of the final scoring of the model, uh, then lasso is not great. And then you might apply something like ridge regression, where it's going to push the coefficients down to zero, but not all the way to zero. So the idea between elastic net is it's sort of like trying to get the best of both worlds. It allows you to sort of shift the slider between the two forms of regularization, the L1 regularization, the lasso, I'm getting those right, right? L1 is lasso, I always get them wrong. Uh, uh, the lasso regularization on the one side and the ridge regression on the other. They both have pros and cons in terms of the performance of the model and its final accuracy uh, and, uh, and the, the, the efficiency of the model. Um, and you, uh, what, what DB has done with this particular implementation is allow you to sort of essentially move that slider back and forth and see how it affects the accuracy of the model in the end. And that's what's known as the elastic net uh, regularization. I cover that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So with that sort of setup, that's just a sort of geometric interpretation, um, uh, I'm going to let DB start talking about how we actually build this algorithm and how we build the optimization of this. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for Stephen for the great introduction. So uh, I'm going to quickly go through the intuit intuitive interpretation of L1 and L2. So think about that, right? In L2, the penalization part of the weight is sum over all the square. So you can think about it. Whenever you have a, a weight which is really large, okay, you penalize it more compared with L1. Because you can think about it, the force gonna be the first derivative of the loss function, okay? So basically, the force for pushing the weight back to zero is the distance from the origin, right? In L2 situation. So whenever your weight is really large, you're gonna more likely push it down to a lot of non-zero element. Because whenever the, the weight is really small, okay, in L2 situation, right, the, the force gonna be really small, okay, because it's proportional to the distance. So when you're near the orange, I mean, it's gonna be really small. So you're gonna result in a lot of non-zero element, okay? But for L1, you can think about that the force constants, okay? So whenever, you know, uh, the weight is far away from the origin, okay? The force gonna be smaller than L2. But when the weight is near the origin, okay? Because the force is constant, so you are likely to push it into zero. So it's a, in, it's a really intuitive interpretation of how we think about L1, L2 uh, regularization. Okay, so let's talk about optimization. Okay, so. We want to minimize the loss function, which contain two parts. One is from the model, the other is from the regularization. So how can we handle that? So there are two standard ways people use. One is the first order method, the other is the second order method. 
For first order method, it's required to have the last function and gradient of the last function. So there are a couple examples. People use gradient descent, LBFGS, OWQN to handle L1. So it's kind of like LBFGS, but it's handle L1. And this is the optimization we use in our implementation. And you can do coordinate descent. And for second order method, it's required loss function, gradient, and Hessian of the loss. Hessian is actually second derivative of the loss function. So it's converged really fast. It's quadratic convergence. However, second order method has some problem. It's scaled horizontally by using spark, by the number of the training sample you have. However, you know, when you train the second order method, it doesn't scale vertically. What does it mean? Because you need to com compute the second derivative of the, of the hash of the, uh, of the loss function, which means the dimension of the Hessian matrix is going to be n squared, and n is the number of features you have. So for lots of classification problems, especially in, in a documentation classification, uh, the feature space can be couple million. And how can you compute a Hessian matrix of that? So it's almost impossible. And LBFGS is so-called quasi-neutral method. For quasi-neutral method, is it using you know, uh, the first derivative gradient information to approximate Hessian matrix? So you're going to get a better uh, convergence rate compared with gradient descent, but you don't need to compute a Hessian explicitly. So that is the beautiful part of the quasi neutral method. OK, now, how Spark implement that? So as you can see, our goal is to minimize the loss function, right? But the loss function has two parts. One part is from the model part. The other part is from the regularization part. But the model part depends on the data. But the regularization part doesn't depend on data. And also, even nicer property is that when you compute the loss and gradient of the loss function, uh, it's turned out to be a summation of each data point. So what we can do is pretty simple, right? You can compute the gradient. Oh, let me go, go to the previous slide. So you can compute the gradient and loss for each observation in parallel and sum them up in the distributed fashion in the executor. OK? And then, and then you re reduce them into the driver. So you get the gradient sum of the total system from the, you know, from the model and also the loss sum of whole your model into driver. OK? And then what you do is that you compute the regularization part and add it into the, the, the one from the, the model part, and you do the optimization, find out the next step. So this problem becomes really easy to parallelize in the end. So here's the diagram of, of what we do. So basically what we do is that we initialize the weight by some initial model for the online setting, or you know, lots of time you can use, it, use, uh, use the previous model as the initial way to improve the convergences. For example, oh, yesterday you do the batch process and train the model, right? And today you have new sample coming, and probably the model gonna slightly change or drift. Then you can use the model from yesterday as initial condition, for example. Okay? So, or if you don't have any, any stuff, then you can use OG or whatever, come out, can, you can come out with more smart way for the initial weight. So you initialize the whole optimization with initial way, and you broadcast the way to all the executor or all the computational node, okay? And in each of the node, you compute a gradient of the objective function and loss, and you sum all the stuff locally first, and you do the uh, all reduce and compute a gradient sum from the older executor. And from there, you can handle the regularization in a driver because it's a pretty cheap process. You can do it in a single node fashion, OK? And you output a result. And you compute, you want to compute you know, if the model is converged or not, OK? If the model is not converged, you go back and use the result from this node and use it as initial condition and train the whole model again. 
until it's converged. And once it's converged, you get your final model. So here is the, uh, the Jira in Spark. So we have a linear regression with ElastinNet implementation, largest regression with ElastinNet implementation in this two story, and it's merged in Spark 1.4. And besides the naive implementation, we do a lot of uh, optimization in the actual code because it's not as simple as what you see, like you know, doing the optimization or kind of stuff. In the R implementation, we do a lot of uh, optimization to improve the convergence. For example, right, you want to do a uh, feature scaling. You want to scale the feature such that it has unique, unique variance, and it's gonna improve convergences. And also, it can avoid penalize some of the uh, column which has low variance because those column which has low variance, their weight's gonna tend to be tend to be really large, right? And once those column has really large weight, you're gonna penalize more on those column. So it's not fair to penalize those column. As a result, you want to scale uh, scale the feature before you do the chaining. But you certainly like that, because if you scale a feature and then do the training data, the way or the model can be, cannot be applied on your original space or on your original data. So you can do a simple linear transformation and map the model back to original space. So the way we do the training is that we chain in a scale space, which means all the data is scale, and then get the model and map it back to original space. But this is gonna, uh, gonna cause some problem, right? Because if you uh, do the standardization on the data set, you're gonna densify the data set. You can subtract by the mean and divide by variance. And if your training data set is uh, really sparse, it's not good. So we do a lot of math to overcome that. So we don't need to subtract the mean, but still get the same solution. So uh, those math can be found in the PR and in the, in the common, actually. Yeah, and for linear regression, the intercept can be computed using closed form. So it can improve the convergence rate further. And for the logistic regression, the initial weight can be computed using the uh, prior distribution of the data set. Okay, so, so here's the result. We compare the uh, gradient descent and LBFGS, and we see LBFGS give you really good performance. And this is the new 20 data set. And you can see LBFGS is working really well, and gradient descent doesn't work at all in the end. And it's RCV1 data set, it's the same. Uh, LBFGS performed really well. Okay, so let's talk about how we implement the experiment. So we are using the new SPA ML pipeline API to do that. So we can miss three components in order to do the whole experiment. So the first one is mapping the stream into the indexes, like a car map to zero, bus map to one. And the second one is doing a polynomial expansion, and the third one is doing the largest regression. So the code is pretty simple, right? You create a pipeline, and the pipeline has three components. The first one is uh, label the, the string, the second one is polynomial expansion, and the third one is largest regression with certain alpha, which is tuning the L1 and L2, and also regularization. And then you can run the experiment with the whole pipeline. Okay, so we use those three data sets, A9A, IZCCN1, and WebSpan, because we want to compare the experimental result with state of our kernel method from CZ experiment result. So this one actually show you, you know, uh, it's A9A, we are polynomial mapping. So you can see the training accuracy is around 85%, and testing accuracy is almost the same. And by adding a regularization, you don't improve the testing accuracy. So the line with dot is testing data set. And this one we do polynomial mapping, okay? So when you, uh, because polynomial mapping actually make your model really complicated. So you can see, you know, the training uh, accuracy is bump up. However, the testing accuracy is lower. But when you increase the uh, regularization, you can see the testing accuracy will be increased. And for this data set, the behavior is different. I mean, this data set, 
uh, is uh, we are uh, polynomial expansion. So you can see the accuracy is around 93%. And this one is with polynomial expansion. It's like uh, 98%. So let's jump to the comparison. So in this comparison, those three experiments is done by uh, Professor Shizelin's paper. Uh, he implement uh, zip linear and zip SVN. Okay, so he trained these three data sets using linear support vector machine, and also linear support vector machine with polynomial to mapping. So this is kind of what I did. He also do it with the kernel method, and then I do these two experiment, the final two experiment. So you can see, okay, logistic regression with polynomial to expansion, you get similar result with the kernel method, state of our kernel method. Okay. However, the training time is away faster, and the scoring time is two order of magnitude faster than the, uh, the kernel method. Because kernel method, all the support vector gonna be in the model. But for the linear model, this one is all just, just coefficient for the features. So we see really good performance improvement. And also, uh, we see that uh, polynomial to mapping with the logistic regression, we see the compatible result with state of our kernel method. Okay, so conclusion is that for uh, some form of linear method with feature engineering, actually give you the same performance as nonlinear kernel method. However, the training performance and scoring performance is away faster. So that's why a lot of advertisement company, they are still using linear model because they are doing the model prediction in the, in the long time, in the, in the real time, and then you want to push out the advertisement as soon as possible. So that's why linear model is really important. They cannot use non-parametric model, which take a couple minutes, a couple seconds to do the scoring. That's not good. And for lots of problem with really sparsity data document classification problem, uh, linear model in general outperform uh, kernel model because kernel model gonna be really complicated. Lots of time you, you even cannot train it well. And with elastic net, sparse model can be trained. So you can find out which column give you the most important information. So that's pretty important. Okay, thank you and question. We'll take questions offline because of time between. Okay.